There are many misconceptions about Miss Gwen Renee Stefani, partly because she has shared so little in recent interviews and throughout her life, she has always let her work do the talking and kept herself and her views in the background. However, if you look a little closer, you'll find that there are actually many discrepancies between Gwen's work and her public reputation and the actual person. This is the story of Gwen Stefani. Born Gwen Rene Stefani on October the 3rd, 1969, she was born to high school sweetheart Dennis Stefani, an Italian-American who worked as a Yamaha motorbikes marketing executive, and Patty Stefani, an Irish-American who worked as an accountant before becoming a housewife. The family wasn't rich, but was solidly middle class, and Gwen could get whatever she wanted. She had a sewing machine in her room as a child and would spend a lot of her time growing up taking clothes from thrift stores and altering them with the help of her mum. This DIY attitude is something that she would keep as she started her career with no doubt and would often make all of the clothes that she wore on stage and off herself. Her parents had a great love of folk music, once having taken part in a folk band called The Inner Tubes and would play folk music all the time around their kids, artists like Bob Dylan and Emmy Lou Harris. However, she was a much bigger fan of musicals and when she first saw the sound of music, Gwen said it changed her life and would ask her parents to buy ensemble recordings of shows like Evita and Annie so she could sing along at home. Even though she played the piccolo in the school marching band, it was only after Gwen got the theatre buzz that she first thought of trying out singing at the school talent show and eventually sung I Have Confidence from The Sound of Music. Going into her tweens, Gwen became even more obsessed with glamour and femininity after discovering the stars of Golden Age Hollywood. Her obsession with Marilyn would later play a great inspiration to Gwen in creating her now iconic 90s makeup look, one that she would never leave the house without, just like her idol Marilyn. While all of Gwen's friends were listening to huge pop artists such as Madonna and Prince, Gwen had gained a fascination for the underground ska revival after listening to bands such as Madness, The Specials and The Selector. She was known as the weird girl at school and wasn't really popular. She was also pretty bad in class and didn't even know if she was going to be able to graduate. However, she did make it to Cypress College in 1987 and it was around this time that everything changed for Gwen. She started sneaking out at the middle of the night to go to the Videopolis nightclub under the shadow of Disneyland. It was around the age of 15 that Gwen first went blonde from her previous murky brown, a decision she says changed her life. Gwen got rid of the ugly clothes that her mom made her wear and started trying out ripped clothes and edgy scar inspired outfits she made herself. Gwen also got her first taste of boys, which was minimal when she saw what boys were really like. Gwen's father saying, Luckily, we never had any troubles with her drinking or taking drugs. She's serious about doing the rock star thing as a profession, as opposed to let's go party. And it was when she hit 17 in 1986, with all those years of experimentation and creativity behind her, that her rock star thing really started. She still wasn't very confident about her voice, but had gained a little self-esteem a few years back when she made a demo recording of a song she wrote called End It On This. Gwen gave the tape to her dad, who played it for his friends and really liked it, telling her, don't ever take lessons because your voice is really unique. There's just something about it. Eric, her pianist brother, thought so too, and when he was going to take part in a school talent competition with a singer friend named John Spence, he told Gwen that she was going to sing too. They would later ask bass player and friend Tony Canal to join, whom Gwen had a crush on, and the band would grow in size and ambition, with Tony introducing Gwen to non-scar artists such as Lisa Lisa and the Cult Jam, Club Nouveau, Depeche Mode, The Cure, and Madonna. They added a guitar player and drummer, and the band found immediate success right from the get-go. However, tragedy struck a year later in 1987 when John ended his life and the band temporarily disbanded. Gwen pushes them all through and the band gets back together once more. Shortly after, Gwen's grandma dies, so all the new members move into Gwen's childhood home, which becomes known as the band house. The band steadily grows a sizable and very loyal following in South California, and they slowly get themselves set up. They finally got their big break in 1990, when an a Tony Ferguson, for the newly created label in the Scope Records, attends one of their concerts, and is impressed by Gwen's onstage presence and the band's hardcore stage diving fans. Tony signs them up for a showcase with the label CEO, Jimmy Iovine, and Gwen blows Jimmy away, taking her aside to tell her, you're going to be a star in five years. The band released their self-titled debut album in 1990, and it flops due to the popularity of grunge no one was really checking out the ska pop sound 
while Interscope refused to financially support a tour or further recordings, no doubt did what they did best and got to work. They self-financed their next album, The Beacon Street Collection, and when released on the 25th of March 1995, the album did well enough to get back into Interscope's good side. Interscope agrees to finance their next recording, but before the band can start the recordings, they go through one last reshaping. Eric leaves the band after feeling the sound was becoming too pop and was offered a job to work as an animator on The Simpsons. Gwen and Tony break up, which shatters the equilibrium of the band and causes them not to speak for a while. But it is in this traumatic period that Gwen finally blossoms as a songwriter and that's when everything really changes for the band. Gwen helps to write their next album smash hit Don't Speak and when Tragic Kingdom is released on the 10th of October 1995, it becomes a worldwide smash selling over 16 million copies. The album would go on to have many other singles such as Just a Girl, Spiderwebs and Sunday Morning and would eventually win two Grammys. Eerily reflecting the Don't Speak music video, the press mainly focuses on Gwen Stefani throughout the whole Tragic Kingdom era, and rumours started to spread that the other three members of the band were unhappy with the lack of attention they received. They would address these rumours and thoughts in their next album, Return of Saturn, released in 2000. Do you feel like there's not enough information out there on Gwen Stefani as a person? How much influence do you think she has had on our culture? Do you think, as one ATRL member put it, that her new music will ruin her legacy? Let me know in the comments down below, like the video, and subscribe if you're new.